so I'll just say a few introductory words uh, before I start. Um, Anita asked me to do this because I actually have a lot of experience in uh, interviewing MPs and MPPs. Uh, and I was actually introduced to uh, Fair Vote Canada at a meeting where we met with John Baird, who was a conservative uh, MP at the time. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I learned that MPs, like MPPs are, uh, or MLAs, are real people. And that the key to a successful meeting is simply to be affable and treat each other with respect. And once you do that, I mean, these are politicians. They're actually interested in being nice to you. They're, they're not interested in making enemies. They're not interested in getting into arguments with you. Um, the best of them will be honest and they will share their true feelings and ask their true questions and concerns and so, so on. So you end up with a good discussion, but by and large, it's not something intimidating. It's not something to be scared of. Uh, the hardest part is actually getting a meeting and uh, that's one of the things I'm going to start with is talk saying just a few words about uh, getting a meeting. So I've organized my slides like this, a, a bunch of points, uh, which I consider to be keys to a successful uh, meeting. And it's also an outline of, uh, of my short uh, PowerPoint presentation today. Um, so the first point is getting a meeting. And I'm going to then walk us through all the way to uh, what I call the postmortem and follow up. So in terms of getting a meeting, uh, I, I think Anita has emphasized this a lot herself in her emails to you. It, it does require a certain persistence. Um, normally, a cold call isn't going to work. And for one thing, under the COVID era right now, a lot of the time, you're not even going to get a line. So I strongly suggest that you, you start with an email, but don't leave it there because you'll never get a response. If you want a response, you're going to have to call. But you need the email as that anchor. So when you call, you can say, well, I sent you an email three days ago. I'm still waiting for a response or I'm calling in follow up, maybe more polite to say I'm calling in follow up to see what could be arranged. Um, if it's looking like, you, you know, you're going to have trouble getting a meeting, you might say well, just a short meeting, something like that to soften it up. And also, I would say in both the email and your initial phone conversation, what you're trying to do is establish a rapport right from the start with the person that you're going to be uh, seeing. Um, and, and we had this in a meeting which I participated in just last week with Greg Fergus, where we had a little tour de table at the beginning, and it was really interesting. Everybody in the room was able to indicate some sort of rapport that they had with the MP. Either they'd met him before, they'd talked to him before, they'd written to, to him before, they voted for him, whatever. Uh, the thing is to establish that connection early on. And you can start right with the email. And when I write my email, I'll usually say, you know, dear so-and-so, you might remember we talked about this at this other point or whatever, you know, uh, just try to, to establish a personal connection, not just your uh, a, a Joe Blow from nowhere uh, kind of thing. Um, you might mention that you're a constituent. I think that's really important. They will normally prioritize constituents. And now in the COVID uh, period, you'll mainly be writing, uh, you'll be reaching the constituency office rather than the office in Ottawa. A lot of them are not even uh, in Ottawa. So start with an email, follow up in a couple of days uh, with a call to the constituency office and ask for the person responsible for managing appointments if you can. It's, there's usually more than one person and there's one person who's responsible for managing a calendar of your MP. So that's the person you wanna to talk to, you introduce yourself, indicate that you're a constituent, refer to your email so the person can find it. And usually if you give them your email address, they'll do a search and within two minutes, they've got the email in front of them. That works really well, really well. Now, they may say they wanna to talk to the MP first. Sometimes they will do that, in which case you'll probably have to call again uh, or email again to try to get that, uh, that interview that you're after. So some of you on this call already have emails or you've already done this before. I mean, I already have appointments or I've done this before and really that's not what you're mainly trying to get uh, from me today. Um, but I, th I thought it was important to cover that subject as well. Now, the next slide is preparations. You don't wanna go in cold, so you wanna prepare. Uh, the first thing I always do um, before going into an interview is I will look up the writing on Wikipedia and often from the writing in Wikipedia, you'll have a link to your MP as well. So you can go to the, your MP's 
uh, page and learn more about the MP. It's good to know a little bit about your MP uh, and also what the politics of your riding are before you go in. So that's always useful. And when I actually write up my reports afterwards, I always put a little background um, or, or I will include the background for colleagues who are also participating in the meeting. That's That can be very useful. Now, Anita has circulated a, a, quite a vast uh, array of materials with you. And what I've done here is I've just included the links to all of them so that you have them right at hand. Um, the proc motion itself that we're meeting MPs about, and it includes what the terms of reference of the study uh, would be. So the motion is for proc to do a study on a citizen's assembly. And here are the different things um, that are outlined in the motion. So I think that's really useful to know. You wanna look at that, it's very short. It's just a paragraph. Um, Secondly, familiarize yourself with Fair Vote Canada's Citizens Assembly strategy and the rationale for it. You can find that on our website and it's indicated, the link is here. You can have it, you can get it in French if you want as well. So I put the, the French link and the slides as well that Anita has prepared on Citizens Assemblies are also available in both English and French. Um, and then finally, Anita has shared with you talking points by party. So they've got, she's got talking points for the NDP and the Greens and the Bloc. And then she's got talking points for the liberals and talking points for the conservatives. So you can have a look at those uh, depending on who it is that, uh, that you're actually meeting. Next step in terms of preparation, and this is actually quite important. It's being done a little differently now in the COVID period than it normally is. Normally what we'll do is we will meet in a coffee shop about a half an hour before the meeting and we touch base uh, in terms of talking points and what, who's gonna do what, uh, that's really important. Since we can't do that in a coffee shop now, what we did for this meeting with Greg Fergus, we organized a Zoom meeting and we reviewed, I basically walked them through, through this, uh, but we also, we decided who was going to talk first and, and what the structure of the, of the meeting would be. And we even identified somebody who would do a screenshot uh, for us uh, so that we'd have a picture to go with. Uh, so that was all very useful. And that's that's something I strongly recommend for any of these meetings. Now, normally what we'll do is one person will set up the meeting. And as soon as you've got a meeting, you identify, you contact Anita or somebody else. Uh, if you have a chapter, it might be your chapter leader to try to round up more people. So, I mean, the main thing is getting the meeting, right? And it's only when you know the meeting that people will know if that's a time that accommodates them or not. But that doesn't matter. Usually once you've got a meeting, a lot of people will line up to attend because it's fun. These are fun meetings. Uh, so people will want to go. And often it's easy to collect a half a dozen people that way um, once, you've, once you've got it set up. So general observations. Uh, you are here as a citizen to express your concerns and hear the MP's views. I've worried it this way to suggest this is not an argument. You're not going there to tell them what to do. Uh, and you really want it to be a dialogue and not an argument. So, you know, that, that affects how you relate with your MP. Um, and I've just written here very quickly, agree first, then add something, right? So rarely will you want to say, I disagree with that, or you're wrong. <laughs> That's not the kind of things you want to say. Find something in what the MP said that you agree with, agree with that. And then if there's something that you agree, you disagree with, you might say something about, well, one thing I, I think we need to nuance is this or whatever. You know? So you figure out how to do that. Um, thirdly, have an ask. So it's very easy to meet with your NP and have a general conversation and go home and nothing happens. If you don't actually ask your MP to do something, then he's not going to, he or she is not going to do anything. So your ask is important and you want to have your ask at the beginning and repeat it at the end and follow up and maybe repeat your ask in, in your follow-up. So follow-up is also a very important part of this. Finally, manage your time very carefully. You, you often don't know ahead of time how much time you're going to have. Uh, it's rarely more than 30 minutes it's rarely less than 20. So you can plan on 20 to 30 minutes. And then if it gets really interesting, usually the MP or their assistant will have left some time at the end that's free so they can stay a little bit longer, but they always have an excuse if they have to leave, right? So that's how it works. Uh, so you have to be careful to manage your time carefully. And that's what the next slide is about. Time management in four parts is how I've called this slide. Uh, the first uh, point, getting to know each other, sounds very innocuous, but it's actually very important. 
often in a meeting like this, you'll have one or two people who are kind of like the experts and who are probably going to end up taking up most of the time uh, allocated to you. But we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to express themselves. And in my experience, this first round, which is basically a tour de table, where you get everybody in the room to say why they are there and why they care about this issue, gives everybody a, a chance to say what's most important to them, and also impresses the MP that there are a number of people out there who care about this issue. So this is actually a very important stage, and I, I would not pass on this. Um, you know, you can spend 10, 10 minutes on this, you could spend five. I think that's one of the things you have to be careful about, because if, if you have a lot of people in the room and you want to make sure you can get through the whole meeting, you don't want people monopolizing this part of the conversation with five minute speeches. Usually it's between 30 seconds and a minute is what you allocate to, uh, to each person. Then the pitch. Uh, that's the most important thing. And, and I didn't used to think of it in these terms, but this notion of your pitch keeps coming up. It's the MPs themselves will say, okay, what's your pitch? They want to know what you have to say. They want to know what you're there for. And that's the pitch. Um, so I think the, the, the expression is perfect. It's the one you need to use. Um, in our case, um, it's the citizens idea, the citizens assembly idea as an emerging opportunity to move the agenda forward on electoral reform. That's the central message that we're uh, trying to convey out there that this is an exciting idea. Um, and, and you want to support this idea. Um, then, of course, or even before, you want to say a few words about the PROC motion, because what the PROC motion is, is an immediate opportunity to get things going on this file. We've been talking about a citizens assembly for quite some time now, but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. In this case, we'd now be having a serious discussion in a parliamentary committee meeting. And if it was to pass, then it would go to parliament itself to be discussed. So this is actually quite an important opportunity. And this is what you wanna to try to impress on your MP, that this is an opportunity we wanna be taking uh, uh, we want taken seriously. And then we want to ask our MP if they would be prepared to help us spread the word about this in some way. And, and there it may be up to the MP him or himself or herself to suggest what they might be able to do. But here in these introductory words, you, you put it out to there, you put it out there that you want some help with this. You're not just there to sensitize them and then go away. Um, engagement, that's what I call the last, the next section. And this is perhaps uh, certainly the most interesting one where the MP will come back to you with their general impressions, concerns, and so on. And you get into a real dialogue here. Um, and so that, I think that's important. And then when you get close to the end, you're going to be reiterating your ask, maybe trying to be a little bit more precise and closing the meeting with some thank yous. This has been great. It's so much, uh, so interesting to get to know you, that kind of thing. And this might be a good time to actually ask to do a screenshot um, or else somebody can just take one. But usually if you can ask that, that's more polite and also shows that you're, you know, you're pleased to be there and you want a record of your, of your meeting. Uh, moving on then, in terms of speaking points and, and discussion, different people who are participating in a meeting will have key speaking points that they want to put forward. And I don't think it's necessary to coordinate all of that, uh, but do have in your mind when you go into a meeting, what the points are that you would like to give special importance to and watch for your opportunity to, to bring those in. You've got all those speaking points that Anita has put, uh, put together. Keep in mind that the speaking points differ by party because the politics differ. Um, but generally you're trying to make the case for a citizens assembly and the idea being that electoral reform is something that belongs to citizens and that the way to get a citizen's perspective in the best way possible is through a citizen's assembly. At some point, you might want to talk about the disadvantages of referendums. That may come up as well. Um, in, in terms of handing things over to citizens like we are proposing to do in a citizen's assembly, I think it's really important in this situation to emphasize the advantages that there are for politicians in handing over an issue like this to citizens themselves, uh, avoiding this whole issue of a conflict of interest um, and, and finding a way to do the right thing despite the political stresses that an issue like this can, uh, can, can envisage. Now here it's really sensitive. You don't want to sound like you're accusing uh, the MP of being in a conflict of interest. They, they may read it like that 
And in fact, when we met with um, Greg Fergus, um, I used the expression, a stark conflict of interest, and he took objection to that. And I realized afterwards that uh, he saw it as an accusation. I didn't mean it as an accusation at all. They are in a very sensitive situation and conflicts of interest happen all the time. And when they do, what's the appropriate approach? It's to recuse yourself, which is what we're suggesting here. We're suggesting that politicians recuse themselves to the extent that they create a citizen's assembly and let a citizen's assembly provide the recommendations rather than developing those recommendations themselves as politicians who are in a conflict of interest. So they recuse themselves, hand it over to a citizen's body, and then the responsibility for implementing those recommendations remains with parliament, remains with politicians, uh, but at least you've got that intermediate step. Um, and I, I put here, ask them to be courageous and address the issue from a citizen's perspective. We need your help. So this is important to make the MP realize that they have a positive role to play here and that he is he or she is needed. Um, and if they're liberals, the issue of recovering from the failure of the broken promise, I think could be a, a very powerful uh, talking point. The liberals themselves, after the ERRE exercise, um, had recommended um, in-depth and, and extensive con uh, public consultations to continue. Um, and this is, would be a very effective way to do that. So those are some of the speaking points that um, I've been thinking about. The ask, as I noted, is both the last and the first item to cover. Um, the general ask is, can you help to put a citizen's assembly on the agenda, to get things, discussions going sooner rather than later? And this is true even if a, C a citizen's assembly might not be able to complete its work in this parliament. As long as we get it going, a citizen's assembly is organized by an independent body and could keep going even during an election. It could start before an election, continue during, or maybe slow down during, uh, or pause, and then continue after an election. Once you get the process going, it's a process that will continue to fruition from there. Um, and then ask the MP, is there anything that you can do to encourage your colleagues to make this an electoral issue? So that's your ask. And then wrapping up, uh, thank yous. Uh, if you notice any gaps in the MP's knowledge, and there always are, uh, you might note these and flag them for follow-up. And that will take you to your, um, to your next step. And we can ask them, what would you like to have? What would, would, what would be useful to you? Ask your screenshot. And then the postmortem. So you've had a meeting before your meeting with the MP, you meet with the MP. And again, in pre-COVID days, you meet at the coffee shop before, you have your meeting. And then after the meeting, you just stand around outside and chat for a little bit. It's so much easier. Um, but if, if, in the COVID period, that's not so easy. Getting that postmortem meeting may be a little difficult. Um, sometimes you can actually just stay on the Zoom call. That's what uh, a couple of us did last time after the meeting with Fergus, but it was their Zoom meeting. So <laughs> maybe they were recording our conversation. So we did our little postmortem that way. Alternatively, you might hang up and just start again or have another uh, Zoom call, or maybe just a few key people can get together and, and do a little postmortem by phone. Uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily everybody. Now, somebody will have volunteered normally to be a note taker. I often end up being the person to do that myself. It is very valuable for everybody if you can do a report. It's useful even for people who participated in the meeting in terms of organizing their thoughts. Um, it's useful for Anita, who tries to keep a record of what MPs have had to say about proportional representation in the past. Um, and it's useful for yourself if ever you visit again. I know myself, for instance, in this meeting that we had with uh, Greg Fergus, um, I'd met with him twice before and one of my colleagues had met once and we had three reports. I was able to read all of those reports before going into the meeting. That was extremely useful. There's a link here. I'm not gonna get you, uh, log you into it, but if you look at it, you can see what, what, a, what a, a good report looks like. Uh, in this case, we actually have the screenshot at the top. So it makes it uh, beautifully attractive. We have a background section. Um, we have a very short section on the tour de table, could have been more, sometimes we make it detailed, but in this case it's not. 
um, and then the pitch is summarized, and then the discussion. That's the most important part. What was discussed, and and where did the MP, you know, what was the MP's starting point? Where did they end up? What the what were the MP's concerns? And then right at the bottom, there's a draft email which. Uh, we shared amongst colleagues and refined a little bit, and then it was sent to Greg Fergus. So there's your follow-up right there in the form of an email. Um, so that's, that's a very important part of the process. If you can find the time, if you don't have a lot of time, do a quick and dirty one, but please do some sort of report. I would encourage you to do and share it with Anita, share it with your colleagues. I'm not going to talk to this annex, but you have the link now. What I've done here is simply um, summarize the talking points and the ask for each party drawing on material that is in Anita's, um, Anita's uh, documentation that she shared with us. So that's it. I'm going to shut, the, um, shut this screen share and then uh, check for questions. We've got quite a bit of time. Um, it's only 1.30, so we still have half an hour. So I'm going to go to the Q&A section. Um, so I'm just going to start at the top. Uh, Stephen Cohen is asking if we can get email addresses of others in a specific writing. Um, in our case, so if we look at this meeting that we just had with um, Greg Fergus, Anita had shared with us all the email addresses of all those who'd signed up. We were seven, I think. And uh, we all had them. Camille Paradis, who was coordinating for us here in Ottawa, um, he had that list. And we went back and forth and exchanged all kinds of emails before, before we went in. So that, that was very useful. So I would think whoever is leading in a writing that Anita would be sharing the email addresses with you. And then whoever that, so th this is the lead for a particular meeting, right? There's always somebody who's getting the meeting or who's leading on it. Um, then you can be in touch with each other that way and organize, you can organize your Zoom meeting that way. Should we ask for a binding citizens assembly? Stephen asks, this is Stephen Cohen. Um, that word binding is difficult. Um, I, I always try to find softer language than that, you know, basically that uh, accepting to be instructed by or to take the citizens assembly very seriously, committing in advance to take the citizens assembly recommendations very seriously or to act on them is another way to say it. Uh, the word binding, no politician wants to be held absolutely firmly to everything that a citizens assembly recommended. So uh, I would just avoid that language, but you wanna use language similar to that. Act upon, I think is a good one. Um, someone's asking me to send resend the links to the um, to the slide, so I will just do that right now, just by hitting paste. There you go. So that's done. How to manage dialogue with the after the MP has asked questions and made comments? Okay, so that's a good question. This is Sue Young asking this. Um, you have to have in a meeting, like depending how many people you have. You have to have a master of ceremonies, if I may. Um, somebody who's going to make sure that um, people aren't spending too much time monopolizing the conversation. I've had meetings like that where this has happened. It, it did not happen in this last meeting. It went uh, very well, actually. Uh, but when you have your pre-meeting, depending how many people you are, when you have your pre-meeting, one person should be identified as being there to manage the, the conversation. I don't know, Sue, if that was the question you, the, the answer you were looking for or the kind of information, but uh, I'm hoping it does. Okay, so there's another, more people asking for the link and I've already reshared that. The, the link is in the chat if people can't find it. Yeah, it looks like people have found it now. All right. Um, okay, this is a lot of people were asking for the link here. <laughs> I was wondering about the broken promises for conservatives. Might we hammer this point home to conservative politicians to entice them to take up this issue? Yes. Um, that's a little tricky. Um, but basically, I would say for the NDP and the conservatives in particular, and this is kind of like a gotcha moment for them. Um, if they call for a citizens assembly, 
and the liberals don't deliver, then they can be held to account in a couple of ways. One is it can be pointed out that the liberal members of the ERRE themselves had recommended more public discussions. And this is precisely the best kind of discussion one could possibly have a citizens assembly. It's in depth, um, it's deliberative, it's nonpartisan. So what's with it with you liberals, right? They could do that. So there's a big incentive, I think, for conservatives and the NDP to vote for this motion, and they would be able to get traction out of it, even if the liberals voted against it. In fact, and this is important, the NDP, the conservatives, and the bloc together actually have enough votes to pass this motion, even if the liberals said no. Now, why would the liberals say no? I don't know if they will. Uh, I know Anita is very pessimistic about that, partly because Trudeau has been trying to just bury this issue. Um, and also they've ignored our repeated requests for a citizens assembly. So that there are some reasons to believe that they might vote against it, but it might still pass. Um, at the same time, it's not up to us as Fair Vote Canada to be advocating for a partisan approach to this issue. And so that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Uh, you know, this whole gotcha moment thing. Um, I think it's better to try to emphasize the nonpartisan reasons for a citizens assembly. You know, the issues about how electoral reform really shouldn't be a partisan issue. It should be something that allows all voters to have equal voting rights for everybody's vote to count as much as everybody else's. And everybody knows that that's not currently the case. So the people to hear from on this issue, the people whose values are important are citizens themselves. And that's why we need a citizens assembly. I, I think I would emphasize that over the gotcha arguments, but if they come up, uh, often one can exchange a little smirk and say, yeah, that's actually a pretty good one. <laughs> Something like that. You know, if you do it in a, in a, a smiling way, I think it, it can work out okay. But it, we really have to emphasize as Fairville Canada that we're nonpartisan. Um, okay, so somebody here again is asking about the links. The links are in the PowerPoint and the link to the PowerPoint is in the chat. So once you've got the PowerPoint, you can just go through it. You find a bunch of links in there. And uh, oh my goodness, so many people couldn't find the link. So the reason some people couldn't find the link, by my understanding, is that if the link is shared early in the call and you arrive five minutes late, five minutes late, you won't see the link. So I think that's what's happening there. What if you've had a meeting with your MP? How do you approach it with a fresh perspective? Um, I'm not sure here, it depends what the previous meeting was about, but in the case of Greg Fergus, uh, we'd had three meetings before and that really wasn't a problem because the perspective in this case is very different. We weren't there to discuss different types of proportional representation or whether proportional representation was a good thing or not. We were there to talk about PROC as a special opportunity. We were there to talk about a citizens assembly as a way to hand this over to citizens, given that politically it's so difficult to get electoral reform passed in, in any other way. Referendums have passed, failed us in the past. Um, and we've had a lot of disappointments with politicians themselves because once they get elected under the current system, well, lo and behold, they don't wanna change that system. And so a politician or a party that might've advocated for PR before now gets elected with a false majority under the current system, they lose their appetite for change. So we need a new solution. And that's what we'll be talking about here. And I think that is very much a, a fresh perspective. Um, even Fair Vote Canada hasn't been advocating for a citizens assembly for very long. Um, it's been for a couple of years, basically. Um, before that, we were talking, you know, we were always advocating electing more MPs who support proportional representation. And it turned out that didn't actually work because when they got elected, then they weren't so keen on it anymore. More people wanting to see the link. <laughs> now, 
Okay, so it looks like we have, okay, we still have a problem with the link. All right, all panelists and attendees, paste. All right, I'm so sorry. I think now you must, you must have it. What's the best number of people to have in a meeting with an MP? In my experience, uh, I, I've been in meetings where you had as many as 10 or 11 people, and it's really not a problem. Having more people, I mean, you're not going to want 50, obviously, uh, but you're never going to get more than 10. That's the maximum. That was with Catherine McKenna a few years back. It was a great meeting. Um, obviously, when you have that many people, somebody has to manage traffic. That's what you have to be careful about. Uh, but you would allocate then a little bit more time for introductions, obviously. And then normally uh, in the discussion itself, then it's, it's, you know, there's a more limited number of people who would participate actively anyway. Um, so I really don't find it's a problem. Best number, I don't know if there is a best number, but I would say one is not necessarily the best number. Uh, three or four would, would be good. Um, although I've had meetings one on one, but that's, you know, as President of Fair Vote Canada. So it's a different kind of conversation than when you're having a constituency meeting. And these meetings that we're having nowadays are constituency meetings. I can't wait to start reading comments that people can now see the link. <laughs> Why isn't a citizens assembly already together? Why can't we create one? Why do we have to ask to create one? Are the protocols to create it for me? Okay, um, we have actually thought about this idea and it does happen that an independent organization will create a citizens assembly. There are two problems with that. One is a citizens assembly can be fairly expensive. So when it's an outside organization that decides to put it together, then it, it's reduced budget kind of thing. It, it has to be much more modest. The other one is that if you want the government to pay attention to, re, to the results, there's a big advantage to having the government convene the citizens assembly. So it's gonna be bigger and there's gonna be more attention to it, bigger public education effort that accompanies it. Uh, citizens assembly that's organized independently may have a little bit more trouble uh, getting attention. You can see the Citizens Assembly on Climate Change in France, for example, that uh, took place about a year ago, got huge coverage. It was a huge Citizens Assembly and the government uh, made a big deal of it. Um, this was in follow up to the Gilets Jaunes uh, phenomenon in France that they realized that government acting alone on unpopular climate change uh, initiatives wasn't going to work. So they handed it over to the Citizens Assembly to take the heat off. And I think it was very successful in that regard. So yes, it's possible to do a Citizens Assembly independently. It's not ideal. What I think would be ideal is a little bit what we're trying, what we're trying to do in Prague is to get other parties involved as well. And normally what I would like to see, and I think everybody would like to see is that the terms of reference from the citizens assembly should be done by consensus. It's not just one guy, it's not just the liberals or previously at one time they, the, the Harper government setting up the terms of reference on their own, convening a citizens assembly that doesn't get too much public attention and so on. No, we want it to be a multi-party initiative, strong consensus all around and a highly public uh, kind of activity. All right, here's somebody who finally see, sees the link. I'm so sorry that uh, I hadn't noticed that I was sending it out just to panelists. Again, I'm not used to uh, webinars and so I'm not used to the rules of the game. Um, just to clarify, the reason why MPs who supported PR don't act on it once they're elected is because under first past the post, they're elected with, with a false majority. So they don't think the idea of PR will be popular. Okay, so what's happening here is, yeah, if you get elected with a false majority and you want to bring in PR, everybody's going to observe very quickly that 
Well, a false majority is just that. And under PR, you don't get a false majority. So governments that want to continue forming a majority tend to want to retain first past the post. So that's one thing. So we have that in, the, in Quebec right now, for example. The CAC, the Coalition Avenir Quebec, when it was in the opposition uh, and hadn't been hurt by first past the post, was a strong advocate of proportional representation. Then they got elected to a form of false majority government with only 37% of the popular vote, I might say. They have something like 60% of the seats with 37% of the vote. Um, and what happens is simply their ardor for proportional representation declined. They still went forward, but what they tried to do in consultation with their own caucus was to put forward a type of proportional representation that would not be that proportional. So they might still win a majority, which is pretty interesting. It's a very watered down uh, proposal that, uh, that they've been put forward and they've been strongly criticized for that. So that's one thing. But the other thing is in terms of uh, MPs, MLAs, MPPs themselves as individuals might not get reelected. So for example, if you're a liberal MLA in Quebec in, in Montreal, and almost all, you know, a very large proportion of the seats went to liberals. Well, if you had proportional representation, the proportion of the seats that would go to liberals would be much less. And so you get, you know, from 25 to 30 to 35 percent of, of MPs or MLAs or MPPs who can see that if you change system, they would actually not probably be elected again. So now if you've got let's say 30% of MPs who feel they won't get elected again with PR, and those 30%, well, they're in solidarity with all of their colleagues. So now their colleagues are also reticent, right? So you get, basically what's happened, what happens is that a party a government loses its caucus. So even if the leader, and this is the case in Quebec right now, the leader and the minister still want proportional representation, they lose their caucus. So that's why they had to water down the proposal in order to try to buy back their caucus. And that's also why they called for a referendum. Referendum being you know, likely not to pass, especially the, under the conditions that they were proposing. So that's what happens. And, and uh, this is a very, very clear phenomenon now uh, that uh, after uh, government is, uh, is elected, they lose their ardor for uh, proportional representation. And so we need to have a way to get around this. It's been a hundred years we've been trying to get proportional representation in, in Canada and the same pattern repeats itself over and over again. A promise to bring in reform when you're in the opposition then you get elected and all of a sudden you forget all about it and you break your promise. It wasn't just Trudeau. It goes back all the way to Mackenzie King in 1921. Is there a way to vote no confidence? What does this mean, I wonder? Well, uh, one could, I guess the question surely must be that one could vote no confidence in the current Liberal Party um, federally. And the, in principle, then the uh, NDP and the, um, and the Bloc Québécois could have held the government to ransom. If you don't bring in proportional representation, um, we will uh, bring down your government. The problem with that is that neither the NDP or the Bloc Québécois wanted an election in any case. And even if they did want to hold the government to ransom, would electoral reform necessarily be the number one priority? Turns out it wasn't. And it turns out they didn't want an election. So it didn't work. And this aspect of, I, I would say this was Fair Vote Canada's long-term strategy for getting proportional representation for years. Elect a minority government and then work with the opposition to demand electoral reform. That has not worked. Um, I doubt it's gonna work anytime soon. Um, we think in Fair Vote Canada now that a citizens assembly is really uh, our best option in terms of uh, moving forward. And, and that's what we have to convince politicians. And we need to convince politicians that this is not a partisan issue. It's not about what's good for them. It's about handing it over to citizens uh, so that we can have a nonpartisan response to this problem and to the problems. I mean, just about everybody recognizes that first past the post is problematic in some very serious ways. So let's, let's give citizens a chance 
to assess for themselves whether they're satisfied with the current system or what they'd like to see uh, instead. I think I'm out of questions. So if there's nothing else, I'll just wait a second more to see if um, anything else comes up. Otherwise, we can go home early. We had good attendance today, by the way. I see uh, 46 attendees here in the participants list. I recognize some of the names as being people who probably already know um, how to do uh, MP visits, but most of the names are not. Uh, here's Eric McCabe, who's from Ottawa. I know him. Most of you, I think, are, uh, are fairly new. So I hope you found this useful. Anita, did you have any comments you'd like to make in closing? Nope, just thanks for doing this, Riel. Thanks for everyone for joining us. If, I hope if you're uh, if you haven't signed up to visit your MP, please do. Uh, we sent out a couple emails in the last month. Uh, the most helpful thing you can do if you feel a little more reassured after listening to Riel is make the appointment with the MP. No, nothing will happen until we have a date. But once you have a date, we can support you, bring people to get other people in the riding if there are others together to help you. And like 99% of the time, it's a positive experience. I just had uh -huh. a fellow um, the other day who visited his liberal MP in a riding we never had volunteers before ever. But thanks to your wonderful advertising dollars, uh, we had four people show up who had never met each other and the MP had never heard from anybody in the writing about electoral reform and he said to me I was so nervous like for a long time about the meeting I was so nervous and that's what everybody wants right somebody else to do it and then they'll just join right but he said once he once they were there it was fine you know he found out the MP was just a normal person he had been a teacher before he really didn't know anything about this he said you know thanks thanks I'll think about it I mean that may be all you're going to get from a a lot of liberal MPs who are never thought about this before is thanks for the information and I'll, I'll give this some thought and I'll talk to my colleagues. And, you know, so it's, it's all win-win. So we'll support you however, whatever kind of support you need to do the Anita, visit. there's a couple more questions that have come in. So let's maybe just keep it open uh, so I can address uh, those as well. Um, I want to mention, it's, it's very interesting that Anita is talking about being nervous because I've had my experiences being nervous as well. Uh, one of the times I was most nervous was uh, when we interviewed Pierre Poilievre. And, and, and the reason why, this was the time of the Fair Elections Act. We were all really angry about that, right? And, and we also knew that uh, Pierre Poilievre is a bit of a pit bull in, uh, in Parliament, right? In question, in question period. So we were pretty nervous. You know, we knew ahead of time we'd be disagreeing with him. And so, but you know what? It was one of the nicest, best, nicest meetings we've ever had. It was fantastic. It was a, just a totally pleasant conversation. And another example is when we met um, Catherine McKenna very recently after the 2019 election. And uh, what was funny, well, it wasn't funny, but what made us nervous about that one is we just finished having the biggest campaign against Catherine McKenna. We had distributed 45,000 door hangers encouraging people to vote NDP or Green. And we're kind of like, what's Catherine now? How is she going to? face us on this. And she was totally understanding about it. We said, you know, Catherine, this is not nothing personal. <laughs> Please don't take it that way. Because we like the woman, you know, she's she's very pleasant. She's been supportive in the past. Um, but we were trying to make a statement and we did. And the meeting went extremely well. Anyway, so that's just to bolster your point there. It's really nothing to be scared of. It always goes well. It's always fun. It's always a learning experience. And I, I hope everyone here finds it as enjoyable as, as I have found it. Um, someone here is asking whether it's best to stay focused on a citizen's assembly and avoid going into the PR weeds. And the answer is yes, if at all possible. Uh, and, and I underline the words if at all possible, because 
uh, MPs are going to want to get into the weeds. They, they always do. So what you can do if they try to get into the weeds or if there's that inclination is try to push it back, and make it a citizens assembly issue. So for example, in a meeting with Greg Fergus, he brought up the issue of the alternative vote versus PR. He says, you know, we had this meeting before and my point, my point of view still hasn't changed. I still favor the rank ballot. And uh, so, but my main re response was, well, you know what? We don't have to decide that here. This is for the citizens themselves to decide. And what P Fair Vote Canada is proposing is that the citizens assembly would consider first past the post, the alternative vote, and different ways of doing proportional representation. And depending which values they tend to emphasize, they will recommend one or the other. Um, so I thought that was a good way to kind of skirt it and get it away from that. But uh, of course, I couldn't help myself afterwards. And so I wrote up a long email <laughs> explaining to Greg Fergus why AD was really not such a very good idea. And Anita helped me with that. Thank you for that incredible graphic that you provided, uh, Anita. Uh, if you guys want to see that, the, the link to Greg Fergus, the report on uh, of the um, meeting with Greg Fergus is in my slides, so you can look it up and you can see that Anita's graphic uh, got incorporated into my response. Uh, Anita, someone is asking here whether they'll be able to see the webinar later. Uh, are you planning to send yeah. a link? So whoever registered for the webinar will send out a thank you and the link, whether they attend it or not, so you'll get it. Okay, very good. Um, someone's asking what are the chances of winning PR at the Supreme Court? So you all know that there's a charter, well, maybe you don't all know, but some of you may know that there's, there is a charter challenge underway. Um, the affidavits have been prepared and um, discussions have started with the federal government on that. Nobody knows what the chances of, of winning are um, people in Fairboat Canada, we do have some lawyers, they think they, the chances are, are slim. The question is whether a defeat can be turned into a win. And that has to do with the wording that the justices will use. So they might say something to the effect, listen, it's not realistic to expect us to overthrow Canada's electoral system uh, as anti-constitutional when we've been using it for over a hundred years. Um, however, it's very clear that our electoral system does violate um, citizens' rights and we would invite the government to look at it or something like that. You know, they, they, they may find wording that uh, that could be uh, a, a win even if we lose. So that's my short answer to that one. I'm interested in the power structure within MP staff. Well, I suppose that varies from MP to MP. Um, it is useful if you can, but I don't know in COVID days, whether they do this, but I've often had the legislative assistant of the MP be a part of the meeting. And that can be very useful because then you can have a conversation with them afterwards and get some, some inside dope, or uh, it's a good way to share information. If you share it with the legislative assistant, then it, it is more of a chance that it'll get to, to the MP. So yeah, so there, if- Can I uh, comment most, on that one, Riel? Yeah, go ahead. So there's there are times when say your MP is a, is a government minister, and they're just not going to meet with you. If you can get a meeting, for example, Krista Freeland is not going to meet with five people in the riding about electoral reform. I'll just tell you that right now. But we can get a meeting with the MP staff. It doesn't hurt to go. It never hurts to go. You know, no. to get a group together and present the information and trust that they will pass that along to the MP. Yeah. Um, another person wanted to know something like, I don't know, are there supporters in my riding? So the process that I go through for the visits that I'm managing, so outside of National Capital Region, somebody uh, somebody will sign up on the forum, uh, the, visit your MP forum. I will get in touch with you. I'll ask you to make an appointment. Uh, once you've made it, once you've got an appointment, which is the hardest first step getting that appointment, then I will put an email out to our supporter list in the writing saying, hey, there's uh, a volunteer has got an appointment to talk about this with MP, blah, blah, blah. Uh, can you join? The more faces, the better. You don't have to say too much, just show up. It's really appreciated. And like Riel said, then sometimes you'll get anywhere from, depends on the writing, from nobody occasionally, you know, to 17 people who wanna join the, the visit. And then I put everybody together on an email group. Hey guys, thanks everyone for signing up. 
Um, I encourage them to have a pre-visit meeting to get together on Zoom, those who can make the time to talk about who's gonna say what. Um, and like Riel said, the way it usually goes is people will share why this is personally important. And then whoever's the agreed upon person will present the content on citizens assembly. And then there'll be a little discussion with the MP. And the nice thing is people get to meet each other, know that they're not the only PR supporter in the riding. But the first step is to sign up and to get an appointment with your MP. And then I will help connect you to anybody else who's interested. If you just put out something to an email list and say, hey, is anybody interested in attending some kind of a vague planning meeting to like help with something, uh, you won't get people. It, getting new people in the door requires a, a concrete time limited action that they can take that they feel will make a difference. Once everybody's met each other, then it may be like Riel was saying, he first got involved through his MP visit in 2014. Then it may be a springboard for them helping again and doing something else in the riding, but you need that first concrete thing. Yeah, and that's why the person who gets the meeting plays a very valuable role in all of this. They're, they're doing the part that people hate the most, including me, I might add. <laughs> I love going to meetings, but I sure hate setting them up. <laughs> There was a time, Anita, do you remember this? Or you, you were setting up my meetings for me. Was I? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, that. you did that. Uh, I don't remember when that was. But <laughs> okay, you, I'm not organizing. volunteering for that role, anyone. It has to be a constituent. That's the one thing the MP wants to know is that they're constituents. They don't want to find out there's people from the special interest group from another province that are attending their meetings. So they'll ask you, most of them will ask you for postal codes of the people that plan to attend. Yeah, Somebody's sure. asking, is it okay to meet outdoors? Like if you have a little group, my experience so far in this round is that every time somebody in a group says, Hey, why don't we meet at the park? Other people say, no, I think people in general are just still too nervous because of COVID-19 and they prefer to meet on zoom, but that's up to your group. A couple more questions here. And maybe we can just deal with these before we close. Uh, one is from Stephen Cohen. He's ask, asking, uh, he's suggesting having a slideshow ready to go. Um, I've been in a lot of meetings. I've never been in a meeting where we had a slideshow. Um, I think you really have to leave things uh, quite a bit more flexible um, and it's gonna work. I, I understand what you're saying here about avoiding a filibuster. Um, I don't know if it's so much a filibuster as that some politicians just like, like to talk a lot. Um, but if you're lucky, you're going to have a politician who, first of all, certainly you'll get through the introduction and you should be able to get through the pitch, I think, without too much interruption. Um, and then after that, the whole point is to have a conversation. So, so no, I would not suggest having a slideshow for this kind of meeting. Um, that's just my opinion. If you've, just to jump in, so if you've signed up, I've sent you visit tips. And in the visit tips, there is a slideshow <laughs> that you can use. So if you want to use it, go for it. I mean, keep it short. Don't waste 25 out of your 30 minute visit going through slides, right? If you just want to look at through it yourself and say, oh, okay, I get the idea of a citizen's assembly. Now I could explain this verbally to the MP in about three minutes, then do that instead. That's what most people will do. But I did have a, a person who used a slideshow and they, they just take it, they edit it, throw in whatever else they want and they do it that way. It's entirely what the person organizing the visit in the group is comfortable with. Uh, sorry, Anita, I'd, I'd misunderstood how you plan to use those uh, those slideshows. I, I it's just it information, an it's an easy way it. for volunteers to get the gist of the citizens assembly, how yeah, they exactly. use it. It's entirely yeah, it's up, up to them. It's up to them. Yeah, I, I remember that part of it. Um, there's another question here about uh, sometimes you might have several people trying to get an appointment. I say, fine, just go for it. <laughs> First one out the door organizes the meeting. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't worry about having more than one person asking for an appointment when you're having. We one. never have that problem. It's a theoretical problem. I actually never have that problem where the MP's office is getting requests for appointments from four different people. It's more the opposite. It's you know, you've got eight people on an email chain and I'm trying to get somebody to agree to be the one to email the office for an appointment. Yeah. Everybody else is just sitting there waiting, hopefully, hoping somebody else does it. So I wouldn't yeah. worry about that. If it turns out there's a couple of different people coming at it, the MP's office will probably suggest putting them together. Okay, I think that's it for questions. Why don't we let people go home? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Riel. Thanks everybody for your patience with my uh, 
challenges, my webinar challenges. <laughs> Thank you, Anita. I'm glad you showed up. <laughs> Thanks, Riel. Okay. Bye, guys. Okay. Bye, everybody.